Mic on? Can you, yeah, okay, here we go. Good morning, everyone. Why don't we uh, do one last call for the folks that are hovering outside and see if we can't round them up and, and bring them on in. First off, for those of you that managed to uh, brave the inclement weather on the East Coast that's rapidly diving into the Midwest, thank you for, uh, for braving the journey and, uh, and making it out here. It's a pleasure to see everyone here. Um, I'd like to just begin this morning. I'm, I'm Dr. Gil Van Bachlen. I am chairman of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, and I'm also privileged to serve as chairman and CEO of Athersis, a company that's focused on developing regenerative medicine therapies. Um, this morning, however, I'm wearing my, my Alliance hat, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the annual Stem Cells on the Mesa meeting. Thank you for being here. It's going to be a very uh, informative and action-packed next couple of days as we have the opportunity to talk about some of the key trends and opportunities and challenges that we all face in our collective effort and our mutual commitment to drive forward the field of regenerative medicine. Um, one of the reasons why I know we're all focused on that is because we share a common belief that regenerative medicine has the power to transform medicine as we know it. There are many exciting things that are going on in the field, and we're going to be talking about many of them, but we're also going to be talking about some of the common challenges that could stand in our way. Things that relate to clinical development, regulatory issues, reimbursement issues, uh, a range of other issues that are relevant to all of us as we look to advance our various initiatives and platforms deeper into clinical development and then ultimately into the hands of physicians and into patients where they, where they will do the greatest amount of good. Now, I'm very pleased to, um, first off, I'd like to thank all of the sponsors that help make the Stem Cell on the Mason meeting possible, uh, including our, our key sponsors, which are shown here on these slides. Um, this morning, we're going to be starting off with uh, a, a, a real honor and a treat. Um, as I think about people that really have the opportunity to shape the industry and help have a profound impact in terms of how things will evolve over the course of the next few years, in many instances, people tend to think first about the companies that are trying to develop the therapies, but the reality of it is, is that there are so many other organizations that are responsible for helping to enable what it is we're trying to accomplish collectively. Um, I, I think that uh, whether it's organizations like CIRM or whether it's organizations like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the companies that are, that are shown here that are focused on developing these therapies, but there's also one other very important category, and we're going to hear from a leader from, uh, from one of these companies this morning. Greg Lucier is the chairman and CEO at Life Technologies. Um, Greg has been described as someone, uh, actually one of my favorite adjectives about Greg, as being a relentless individual that is focused on advancing the field. And he's really driving an organization that is responsible for providing us with the entire regenerative medicine community, with the tools and the resources necessary, if you will, so that we can accomplish our vision of making these transformative medicines a reality. So this morning, Greg is actually going to be sharing some thoughts on key trends, challenges, and opportunities, things that are going on in the field of regenerative medicine. And then that's going to be immediately followed by our first panel this morning, which is going to focus on some of the clinical topics that relate to regenerative medicine. And so with that, I'm pleased and privileged to introduce Greg. Greg? Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a privilege here. Um, when I woke up this morning and um, turned on the, uh, the TV just to see the news and what was going on, and I'm sure like all of you, you saw on the television set all about what's happening on the East Coast. And then you may have looked out your window and looked at the sunrise, and now you can know why we call San Diego home for our world headquarters, because it's a nice little corner of the United States uh, with really just a pleasant uh, place to live. Um, Life Technologies, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a simple tool maker. Um, and at the core of our strategy, we have a phrase that we say, sequence to function, which I think uh, really encapsulates a lot of the work that many of you are doing in the field of stem cells. And I'm reminded of the importance and impact of one change in a letter can have in the function and in outcomes. So I'll tell you a little story. You see there was uh, this couple, one of those dual income, no kids uh, couples, I think they call those dinks as you recall, that was traveling incessantly with their jobs, you know, meeting here and there, but really always on the go. And so they decided at one point that they would have a weekend get together and they were gonna rendezvous right here in, in San Diego. 
And so the husband uh, ended up arriving on the Thursday night. And when he finally got to his hotel room and was sitting out on his balcony overlooking the ocean, he decided to tap out a quick uh, email to his uh, wife who would be coming the next day. Unfortunately, he made one small error in the email address. So across the country, Mrs. Townsend had just returned from the funeral of her husband who unfortunately had just passed away after 60 years of blissful marriage. And they were in the kitchen uh, with uh, the adult children and she said, uh, you know, just pardon me, I need a little time alone. And she walked down the hallway of the house to her study and ended up looking at an email. And all of a sudden, the kids back in the kitchen heard this blood scream and a thud hit the ground. So the kids run down to uh, the study and there Mrs. Townsend had completely passed out. So one of the older kids ended up opening the computer just like this and well, I'll read you what the email said. It said, Dear Love, I apologize that I didn't connect with you all day today, but the travel to here was very difficult with lots of delays. And when I got here, they didn't have a room for me. Fortunately, everything got worked out, and I miss you already. I'm really looking forward to having you join me tomorrow morning. <laughs> Love me. Oh, P.S., make sure you pack light, because I will tell you it's a lot hotter down here than I thought. <laughs> The study of uh, cellular mechanisms and this concept of genetic sequence to function really took a more personal meaning for me uh, a few years ago. Um, I was actually at my home in our kitchen. My mother was visiting, and uh, like many of you, uh, we have kids, and so they had opened the dishwasher, and it was down, and she walked across the kitchen, tripped over it, and fell and hit her head. Beyond the, uh, the bruises and the bumps that she had, um, it seems that bump on her head triggered some sort of neurological action. And uh, three or four months later, she was diagnosed with a version of Parkinson's disease called MSA. And uh, since that point, and this was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, she has degenerated quite substantially and she's now in the near end of her life. But along that journey, I'll just share with you briefly how what you do has taken on a very personal meaning to me. And so when she was diagnosed with uh, what's called MSA, or multiple systems atrophy, which is a, a vector of Parkinson's uh, that has some of the same system, uh, symptoms, but maybe uh, also some of the same kind of root causes of the disease, but doesn't have the shakes, um, they basically gave her a diagnosis that there's nothing they could do. And uh, so very quickly, my mother decided that she wanted to see what she could do in terms of making a difference in future patients' lives that would have this disease. And uh, she knew what I did for a living, and she said, uh, Greg, what if we sequenced me and could see what that could do for people? And so that we did. And so my mother at age 80 ended up getting genetically sequenced on our machines, and it and, uh, turns out that she had many of the known mutations uh, that are associated with Parkinson's disease. Shortly thereafter then, we uh, developed a relationship with the Parkinson's uh, Research Institute in Sunnyvale, California, and uh, we decided to sequence myself and see if any of these mutations had been passed down to her son, and so that we did. And uh, turns out, I have some of the very same mutations as my mother. And so now this has really taken on more of a personal meaning. You know, as a side note uh, to all of this, and I think really more of a commentary of the state of the world of medicine we're moving into, my father um, absolutely initially did not want to be sequenced. And, you know, when I look back on it, it was due to a variety of superstitious reasons and said, hey, you can do it when I die. But more kind of three, four months into that and a lot of dialogue with him, he came around and actually became also a very enthusiastic participant in wanting to be understood and also to contribute to see what could be done in future generations to really solve this disease. And so actually, um, we're just now in the process of gearing up to have my father sequenced as well. And uh, hopefully with that uh, type of information, we'll have one of the few, not certainly only, but one of the few um, family, uh, familiar generations of sequencing going on in the field of Parkinson's to start having a better understanding of this particular disease. You know, beyond that genetic work, I'll just finish off the story with you again on a very personal way of how our work in the field of cellular mechanisms and stem cells 
really has driven not only my passion, but I think also directed our work. Um, this Parkinson's Research Institute in Sunnyvale is a terrific organization that I quite frankly at times don't know how they always make it, but they are one part of research organization and one part of clinical organization that sees lots of patients. And our team here in the audience that uh, focuses in on this work has actually started to have a really great relationship with them. And uh, in fact, what they've now started to do is, is work on IPS cells in terms of figuring out how we could take patient samples, including my mother's, and um, validate them using our qPCR and sequencing technology, and then using our genetic engineering tools to differentiate them into uh, neural cells or neural systems, and then ultimately getting to where we have the disease in the dish for that patient, and we can start to see what the impact could be of various drug combinations. So it's very early days, but you can see how we're trying to make a difference not only in a research way with certain patients, but also back to the core of what we do, and that is trying to figure out how you get streamlined, how you get more effective research workflows to really drive the great work that all of you guys do. So this whole idea of sequence to function, which has really, as I said in the beginning, been at the mainstay of how we drive our organization to go from the very beginnings of reading the DNA all the way out to the tissue of figuring out how we can figure out the function in that particular environment really is, I think, and you can see in this little story, taken on a personal meaning. And I would say to all of you, and I think in many of you, this really perhaps drives some of your work as well. And I never would have thought this is where I would be ending up in terms of having such an interest actually in the outcomes, but now more than ever that I do. And, you know, look, I, I would just say one other thing is that I do believe this idea of linking genetic engineering to the function is also seen by the industry as being very important. I mean, just here in California, CIRM has now released two RFAs for creating two big genetic stem cell centers here in California. And when you look at the NIH money, um, they have earmarked and directed about $85 million year to date here in 2012 for IPS work to really drive this disease in a dish idea. So it's clear we're onto something, and uh, hopefully it can make a difference in what we're all doing. You know, I, um, I've been running Life Technologies for just about a decade now, and I've always tried to uh, really instill in our team that it's our clients and great people like you in academia and industry that are the real heroes, and that our goal is to stand behind you and really drive success. And in many ways, I think it, that's where it, where it needs to be. I mean, in the end, what you're all doing is the discovery, is the real innovation that people will see. However, I would just say in our own way of what we try to do to really drive our people and really drive a passion and a real determination is coming back on a difference of how you see the world. So your work is really concept driven. And I would say that really deserves more of the accolades. If you look back in history of what you do and tie it to other great innovators, you know, it's really in many ways like Darwin with evolution or Einstein with the, you know, the theory of relativity. These concepts have driven the future, and that's understandably so. That when a concept comes to be, people can start to see the future very clearly, and the future starts to happen. There's also, no, though, I think just one other way to look at the world, and that is really more of a tool-driven set of how you see the future. And, you know, maybe behind these great concepts, there was always a toolmaker that ultimately made the difference. So if you go back to Copernicus and how the world, the solar system, really was to be, it was a great concept and ultimately proved to be true, but it was only proven to be true when Galileo ultimately invented the tool called a telescope. And so our work here in Life Technologies is just absolutely driven today then as this tool-driven view of the future. That while the great concepts will come from all of you, our humble role in all of this is to be the tool maker that allows you to ultimately change the world. And we're doing that each and every day by spending hundreds of millions of dollars figuring out how we do this idea of DNA sequence all the way out to function to be behind you so that you can be about the great next discovery. 
I'll just wrap it up with uh, one last kind of call to action that, you know, Gil and I were chatting just here uh, before uh, we uh, got started, and we both agreed that this has been, in some ways, a, a Don Quixote uh, kind of journey of cell therapy, right? I mean, this is a tough space that we're all in to harness and ultimately really great get utility out of stem cells. And yet, I think you can all feel it's starting to now move. It, there is a, a, a sense of change, a sense of that money and interest is starting to come into the field, and I think it's uh, long overdue. But, you know, there are worries on the horizon, at least for me. And I would just say the call to action right now is very much more immediate. If you look at what's about to happen with uh, the fiscal cliff and sequestration, and I'm sure many of you have all been paying attention to that on the TV, but in more particular, that will really devastate, I think, the scientific environment and ecosystem in this country if it goes through. And so I just encourage you to think about what you personally can do in terms of really making a difference in democracy. Talking to your congressman, talking to your sen senator, and just making it clear that the scientific innovation that has driven the great work you do and really, I think, creating just an incredible environment here in the United States is at peril. The NIH next year, if nothing gets changed, will be cut by $2.5 billion. The FDA will take just under a 10% cut. And a lot of the things like we're doing here, which are just a little bit still on the horizon, will certainly be compromised. And so this meeting next year won't be so bright if a lot of those changes and those cuts go through. So again, I really just urge you in terms of a call to action to see what you can do to make a difference in our democracy. So I'll finish it up by saying uh, I, it's really just an honor to be here with all of you. You all are the leaders and uh, I really just you know, spur you on to great success and our team here at Life Technologies is there to hopefully make a difference and stand behind you on your path to greatness. Thanks very much. We'll, uh, we'll get started. We have a uh, few more coming. Yep. There he is. How are you? Greg Luce here. Nice to see you. Uh, wherever, I'm just seeing if we are missing one. Is there, maybe not. Okay. Okay. Well, we're just missing one of our panelists, but uh, we'll. We'll get started without them. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, if I could have each of you just introduce yourself to the group here and uh, maybe just say a few words about who you are and what you're working on uh, so they have a better familiarity with uh, uh, how you see things. Sure. Um, I'm Jay Siegel. I'm a <clears throat> physician scientist uh, with Johnson & Johnson. I spent uh, 20 years at the FDA where I regulated the development of all therapeutic biologics in the latter part of those years and, and uh, going back to the 80s was actively involved with uh, cell cells and black cells, other cellular therapies and created the <laughs> therapy, later the office um, at, uh, at uh, or, or played a part in creating and oversaw uh, those, those organizations. Came to j and as president of Sempicor 10 years ago, I'm now the chief biotechnology officer and head of regulatory affairs, and we have uh, a, a, some active programs in stem cell development for uh, retinal disease and diabetes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jay. I'm Dean Tozer and uh, vice president of corporate development at Shire uh, Regen Med. Um, my background is I, I started in big pharma uh, and then left, uh, went out and uh, was one of the founding executives of Advanced Biohealing. Uh, which started back in 2006 right here in, uh, in San Diego area. Uh, and then I ended up at Shire last year when we sold uh, our business to Shire in uh, June of last year. And we're uh, positioned as the new division of Shire, uh, Shire Regenerative Medicine. And so now what I focus on right now and for the last 18 months is uh, the remit given to us is to now create a global uh, Regen Med division within Shire. Um, and so what I do is I go around looking for opportunities to acquire or license and uh, my background is I'm a business guy, not a scientist, uh, and primarily commercial background is, uh, is what I 
spend my time mostly looking at, so the commercialization of these types of technologies. Excellent. Matthias? Okay. Uh, morning. My name is Matthias Steger. I'm uh, heading up a group called Research and Technology Partnering at Roche. Um, headquartered in Switzerland, that's where I'm based, but obviously a global company. So we're looking for uh, partnerships uh, in this space uh, globally and uh, regarding stem cells. So I'm a scientist myself, started um, uh, more than a dozen years ago for uh, at Roche actually as a scientist, um, but have now uh, biotech experience as well as large pharma and research experience and then have moved to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so now in business development and uh, we have built at Roche uh, stem cell department uh, in research for now for the last five years and have significant um, investments made there and also progresses which I'm happy to tell you a little bit more later. Very good, thank you. Why don't we first start with uh, kind of the concept of innovation in this space and, and where we are. And so, so, um, I think we are all heartened by uh, uh, Yamanaka-san winning the Nobel Prize for uh, his work here in IPS cells. Um, with that as a backdrop, maybe Jay, start with you. Where do you think we are in terms of innovation in this whole field of stem cells and cell therapy? Well, <coughs> the awarding of the Nobel Prize certainly your control. represents your control. Um, recognition in, in the scientific community and I'm sure it will uh, improve or increase uh, public interest and awareness and respect and hopefully you know, not only in the public but in the financial community. Um, where we are is, I think, in, in a challenge of time. The science is there, the, the technology is there. I think, um, as, as you just noted, and I think there, in the bigger picture, there's not only a, a fiscal and sequestration cliff, but there's frankly a, um, a, a worldwide situation where, where costs of healthcare are increasing, um, the costs of innovation are increasing, and um, increasing power of, of payers to, to control what happens. And, I, and I, I appreciate your remarks because I think that all of us need to be out there ensuring that the value of innovation in terms of both medical progress and job creation is critically important. Mm -hmm. But your view, Jay, and maybe just move on to Dean and Matthias, is that the innovation is there, the science is there to really make this happen now in terms of regenerative medicine. Yeah, you know, without going into details, which we might later, I would say that, you know, the utility of iPS cells for, uh, for example, for um, toxicity and efficacy screening is, you know, if not proven, pretty apparent. And I think there's a great deal of interest and I think we'll see some of the benefits of that. Their utility as a, um, Therapeutic modality is, uh, is to me, um, apparent, but I think it's a situation sort of like with monoclonal antibodies. There was a breakthrough in the mid-70s. There was a Nobel Prize in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. There was a trickle of products. Our product, OKT3, came out, I think, around the time or right after the Nobel Prize. But, but another decade or so before the technology, the ability to do it in a reproducible way, a safe way, getting rid of murine retroviruses, getting, you know, in a cost-effective way, evolved, and it's still evolving. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes we overestimate the timelines uh, to, to commercial success, mm -hmm. but, uh, or underestimate, I should say. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that, that that is there and there's real, real potential. So, so I can, second, yeah, please, I can certainly follow up on that and, and confirm. I mean, you know, you have to see also what the Nobel Prize has been awarded to, even though if it's the Nobel Prize for medicine, right? It has been awarded for a lab scientific discovery, which is great, you know, because it, it, it shows that the potential is being recognized, you know. But at the same time, I mean, Shinya himself, you know, says, you know, I think we have to be a bit more modest here, you know, and see that, you know, that there are many, many routes forward to harvest the potential of that innovation. And, you know, it may not be now, you know, that we tomorrow have cell therapy um, on the market, but what it, what it triggered was really um, the potential to, um, to come up with new therapeutic 
modalities even if the modality in itself is still a small molecule, but it can intervene in the endogenous stem cell development, which is per se a, a new kind of modality that opens up um, um, new potential and also address healthcare issues, as you, as you mentioned before, you know, to, uh, to really avoid um, costs that at the moment are associated with um, diseases um, that are currently not met with, with drugs on the market. Mm -hmm. um, Dean, obviously Shire had a real belief in this field to make the acquisition of advanced biohealing. Um, staying on this idea of innovation and technical risk and where we are, um, a calculation had to be made that the technical risk is coming down. It's manageable and commercialization is certainly possible. Your company is a great success of that. Maybe tell us how you feel about where we are in this curve of of technology innovation in the field of regenerative medicine? I always tend to be the uh, cold water sometimes on these subjects because I come from the business perspective. Um, you know, I think what, what I'm seeing is innovation for innovation's sake is not going to work. Um, when, and, and it's a convergence of, you know, with a storm hitting the East Coast, I guess. It's kind of this storm that's happening where you have these technologies that are, uh, for the most part, expensive to develop, as, as Jay said, and potentially expensive to commercialize meshed with this aging population, everybody's living, you know, we all know the story, right? So it becomes much more, and what we're really seeing when we're looking at opportunities is that the business guys are getting involved a lot earlier in, in really taking these opportunities and, and really critically evaluating and, and deciding is there a business to be had there. And, and it's not just can it get to the market and can it help people, but really can you identify a payback model that, that as business people, unfortunately, we, you know, we have to deal, worry about. And, uh, and I, for the first time in my career just recently, we were looking at an opportunity that we actually, in our diligence process, you know, ran a full health outcomes you know, beta mm -hmm. on this opportunity. And, and that was just a diligence exercise. And it's, and it's become that important in our mind uh, about how you identify these technologies that will really add value to the healthcare system, mm -hmm. that will either take costs out, as, as was said, or give such phenomenal patient improvements that a potentially higher price can be justified because mm -hmm. of that. And so as a business guy, not a scientist, I, I do find it interesting that I'm getting drawn into meetings more often now where I have no idea what the scientists are talking about. Um, but all I know is I've got to figure out, is there a business model here? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I see that's really gaining momentum you know, in, in our so, opportunity. So let's talk about that. Um, you know, obviously, to create value, you have to have a problem to solve. And mm -hmm. I think that's what you're uh, uh, alluding to. But uh, you also have to make sure that it doesn't rely on a miracle to get there. And so, you know, again, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I'd love to get you to talk more. In your view, because you're now looking at these big problems you could potentially solve, it must mean that the technology, the, the know-how, is getting to be more reliable to get there. Is that true or yeah, not? I, well, no, it's, it, and we've had this conversation. It's the, the issue that I see from a business perspective when I look at these opportunities is the step change that you want to have from where we are to that healing is you know, just short of a miracle, as mm -hmm. you kind of said. Yet the tradition of medical development is incremental for the most part. Um, you know, I look at Dermograph, was approved in 2001, and only last year did we realize the true value of it in the acquisition by Shire. So you're, you really are in this situation where you're potentially looking at what I refer to more as a life cycle type approach to these technologies. So do you have the first gen, but you have to be able to think, okay, we're gonna launch this first gen version, but there's follow-ons that, you know, from a portfolio perspective, we think can really add value. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very challenging. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it is not an easy space um, to go into and say, how are we gonna make this work? And, you know, don't even throw in allogeneic versus autologous. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that that's just makes the matrix even more complicated. Right. But that's, that's I, yeah. kind of what, what I'm seeing. Okay. Jay, I please. think, you know, um, from an innovation perspective, a, a, as you think about long-term innovation, invariably, well, invariably one thing happens, which is that in, in, competitor innovation improves so that if you're working on a pod project that you're going to launch in five, ten years, um, you're going to launch it into a market where there's tougher competition, um, more other products to address 
the need that you're trying to address. And, and the other thing that usually, but not always happens, is that the value of your product deteriorates. So usually you start out with a pretty optimistic, uh, particularly if you're a small biotech and you're out and you need to raise money, you, you tend to attract people who really are real believers. And as you get the real data, often there's a decline from that. And so um, you really have, even if the innovation ultimately is incremental, to ensure that it is, you have to start out, I think, targeting some substantial innovation, particularly if you're, if you're dealing in a therapy that's going to have significant uh, costs or safety risks, and, and uh, particularly extrapolating into what the reimbursement environment is like to, likely to be um, out five, five or ten years. The costs, I think, you know, I think if we can get through the hump of getting this industry started, my guess is that the costs will come down. We've seen, whether it's recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a floor, but the ability to do these in, in, on standardized platforms and closed systems and mass production mm -hmm. um, ha and, and, and other technological advances in, in almost every field of new technology has really brought manufacturing costs down. And I think in, in the longer term, we could expect the same with, with uh, any type of cell therapy, stem cells in particular. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just add, because Jason, a, a great point is the innovation that also that I'm seeing is not just around the science per se, but in this field, the manufacturing innovation is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we look at our manufacturing facility, which is just sitting down the road, which is you know, 12, 13 years old. And fast forward to technologies we're looking at now that are closed systems that, you know, can be more pod type things that you can plunk in different parts of the world. Um, you know, that's really critical because when you do start to look at, you know, different technologies that perhaps logistics becomes a big part of it, having a manufacturing process that's more transferable and such is, is a big deal. Um, and, and that's where I'm seeing Again, as we do diligence on things, the manufacturing guys are sitting at the table with us, mm -hmm. and the logistics guys are sitting at the table because how are we going to move this stuff around, and how do we make right. it suitable for a global opportunity? Right. Well, why don't we? Uh, we have a new guest, <laughs> <laughs> Greg Lucier. Geography 101. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. No worries. Have us uh, please uh, introduce yourself to uh, to the group and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're working on. Uh, my name is Paul Simmons. I'm currently the EVP of uh, Corporate Research at Mesoblast. Uh, I joined the company about a year ago after about 30 years in academia in the stem cell world over multiple continents. Uh, I was president of ISSCR in 2006 7. So uh, I suppose I come to this, in contrast to my esteemed uh, companions here, I, I come to this probably with a more um, academic feel to the translation of stem cells into clinical therapies. So hopefully I'll, I'll provide some counterpoints to views um, maybe expressed. Well, we'll here. let you jump right in. We were just finishing up the kind of first section of where do you think we are in terms of the <coughs> innovation needed to drive success in this field of regenerative medicine? That's an excellent question <laughs> and a very big question. Um, where are we in terms of innovation? I mean, uh, to me, I'm sure in common with many people in the audience, I personally think the, the major area of innovation would be iPS cells. I think the promise of those cells as the, the basis for a whole range of cellular therapies um, that can to some extent also be personalized, I think. At least they have the potential to be personalized. I think it's extremely exciting. There's a ways to go, obviously, in terms of, of generating a sort of clinical grade product that would be you know, free of the uh, vectors that are, are used to reprogram the cells. That's, that's I think, a, a big issue. But I think, you know, there are major steps in that direction already uh, being taken. So I don't think, you know, as I always say to people uh, in the stem cell field, you can, you know, anyone that puts a time scale on anything is inevitably wrong. So I'm <laughs> sure the, uh, the, the, the time to effective translation when we first see those cells in the clinic will be shorter than we all collectively, collectively mm -hmm. think. Obviously, at the moment, with those cells being used, I think, in the pharma industry, um, I think that's really good. And I think exciting to think about the notion, again, of a personalized medicine approach. I, I was reading a report not too long ago from a group, um, a consortium, essentially, led out of Harvard, where they were looking at um, 
patients that variants of Parkinson's disease, and they were making iPS cells out of those variants as a way of trying to identify drugs that may perhaps you know, better target uh, those specific variants. I think that's a really exciting development. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. Let us, uh, let's segue then beyond innovation and talk about the business of regenerative medicine. And so when you think about the business of bringing a therapy or a solution to the market, what are the key weaknesses then right now in terms of making that a viable payoff? You said you were just looking at one, you went through the whole due diligence, and I won't ask you if you decided to go forward or not, but, <laughs> but clearly you must identify a number of issues that uh, you know, would cause you to have concern or or excitement, and maybe just share with us a little bit about how you see it. I, I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to, um, and it's such a colloquialism that people say, but an unmet medical need, and with a technology that we genuinely believe can make a difference. Um, I think, and again, I was and have been part of Big Pharma for years. I, I think, you know, the days of incremental improvement and and pushing that out there, um, creating a disease state. I did a few of them in my career, um, you know, is, is, is kind of gone. And, and it's really now starting to step back and look at a technology and saying, you know, is this curative or, or does it, and, and we've actually as an organization developed our own definition of Regen Med and, and it's very focused in this idea of either aiding in healing or curative. Uh, palliative is not even in our, we don't even want to go there. Um, and so that's where we've really kind of put our stake in the ground and said we are going to do regen med. You know, we are going to do things that are not, for the most part, palliative. And so I think that's Is there an abundance of uh, areas then that fit that particular uh, geography? In theory. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but I say that are not well served by other solutions. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And but again, I say somewhat in theory, jokingly, because most of those are still phase one. You know, maybe preclinical. So it's still somewhat theoretical, but uh, you know we tend to look for things that are maybe in a phase two that you've got you know a signal that there is that potential. Um, but that's I, I think where we really focus is this idea of finding these regen med approaches that can really truly either cure or contribute to the curing of, of a disease or a condition, uh, and that's. That's kind of the business model that, that we're very focused on. Matthias, is that the same way it is at Roche as well? I mean, you're looking for big, clear, unmet medical needs where regenerative medicine is really the only viable path forward to get there? I'm not sure it's the only viable path yeah. to get there, but it's, it's, it has the potential to be a path to get there. And these are truly the big unmet medical needs as we face them, you know, like Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's, but also in the cardiovascular metabolic mm -hmm. area. There are big unmet medical needs, which I think are prone to be solved by regenerative medicine, you know. And uh, with, w with the advancement of the, the science that we have today, and <coughs> I mean, it's, it's, well, it's certainly the, the most exciting field as for a scientist to be in, uh, in molecular biology these days, you know. And, um, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not fully supportive of, <laughs> of what you said before. Um, sorry. Well, we like controversy, so yeah, why don't yeah, we... So, uh, uh, but but I, will, I actually <laughs> will agree with him somewhat. Um, but, mm. you know, when you look at diseases of aging, and this is where I, I'm always careful because I'm not a scientist, but, you know, most of them are driven by this degeneration of, of the body. Well, by definition, Regen Med should address that. And so if, if, you, if you take, you know, and, and I often say Regen Med is not the what, it's the how. And so if, if you really are true to what Regen Med should do, the technologies, then you should be able to address these diseases that are, the outcome is the degeneration of the body mm -hmm. as, as people age. So we tend to be pushed towards, you know, looking at disease, older population. Again, that's just where we're focusing. It's not that there aren't others, but... Um, and I agree, uh, you know, gene therapies, there's lots of other things as mm -hmm. well that, that fall in there. So I don't think, you know, cell-based is, is the only regen net or the only solution. It just tends to be where we're looking. And, but to come back to answer your question, mm. actually, which I didn't so far, basically is, uh, yes, so if you have unmet medical needs that, that solutions um, potentially are there to help, then you have a business case, right? Yeah. I mean, whether this is, you know, then you can discuss, you know, what issues there are to get there, you know, with regulatory, you know, and, 
and clinical outcomes, you know, personalized medicine, biomarkers that need to go with it, and, and all that. There are a lot of things to be solved, you know, but if there is a potential and um, the science is supporting, you know, the, the evidence to actually get there, then we should, we should go the path, you know, but mm -hmm. it, it will be not be an easy path, yeah. <coughs> I guess I'd add that the other thing, I certainly agree. In fact, I, I think I said before that you need to start out with an expectation of a, of a high level of differentiation against an important need, um, in part because that won't hold up, and in part because if the, if, if the, uh, the product is likely to be costly, then um, you know, I think there's a growing demand for cost effectiveness, and it's mm -hmm. not going to be successful unless it has a pretty high level of, of effectiveness. But I think another key factor when you're thinking about early stage products and high risk technologies, aside of course from assessing all of the risks, is um, how can they be de-risked? How soon and how early? So for certain products and certain disease states, you may be able to get not only a pretty good idea from an animal model, but also from the first few patients that you treat, whether your product is, do is having the desired activity. Mm -hmm. Those sorts of things are much more desirable to invest in than in other areas where lacking the right biomarker, lacking the right understanding of the disease, um, you really need to get large numbers of people in a controlled trial uh, in order to know whether you have a product. Because that's where costs really start expanding. Sure. And in an area where it's just by the odds likely as you're preclinical that most products will fail, you want to be able to identify most of those failures as early as possible. The other, the other reason no, that's... I'm sorry, just to interrupt you there. Does the field then of regenerative medicine solutions fit the bill there? That it allows you to get <coughs> answers earlier for cheaper yeah. or not? I think it more depends on the disease. You know, if you're you know, some of the areas we're in, um, like retinal disease, uh, there's visual acuity, but even short of visual acuity, there's imaging and other things you can see in early effect, diabetes. There's um, things you can check early in, in, in humans. Another area we've had interest in, in stroke, I would say, is, is quite different. Mm -hmm. in, in the case of stroke, it's hard, you know, because if you treat a patient who's had a stroke, the, uh, there's a broad range of outcomes that are, and we don't know how to predict them from, from death or severe disability to complete recovery. You treat a few people and they recover, you still have no idea what you have. The, uh, the other problem and the other reason why that's, that's uh, one of the critical factors in, um, in um, selecting a, 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 a therapy to invest in is because I think it's really important that you know exactly what the expected mechanism of action is. Um, it's not, if you try to, to, to um, develop something that worked in a reasonable animal model, but you're, you don't know why, and cells do lots of things, and so we've certainly seen examples of that, that's pretty tricky, because ultimately to develop a product, you need to ensure as you evolve your manufacturing technology and then upscale, that the product is the same. And it's not so easy to characterize all the things there are about a cell. So mm -hmm. having a good potency assay that is relevant to the, exp or, or assays or panel of assays that really characterize your expected mechanism of action is really important. And, and interestingly, those, there's a little bit of a going hand in hand of, the, of having an early indication of whether the product's working and understanding its mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. so that way you both get if right. you understand the mechanism of action, you're more likely to be able to develop a good potency assay and more likely to also to know whether the cell is having that action short of the product, short of doing a large That's control a trial. Point. That's a good point. Paul, we were just chatting about uh, the risks to the business model of regenerative medicine and two of the areas besides what Jay had just said in terms of having and understand early if it's going to make an impact was also the cost structure of providing these therapies. What, how do you see the risks to the business model in terms of the field of regenerative medicine? Hmm. I'll be candid. That's, that's really not my, my field of expertise. I think what you've heard from the other panelists is much, I'm much more in research. Uh, so I, well, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask this question then. In terms of uh, how you think about the, the field of regenerative medicine, maybe share with us then your 
your views of allogenic versus autologous approaches to the therapies and, mm. and the challenges both on the discovery and the development side. Sure, sure. I think um, obviously, you know, people know, know, know our company now, we're based on an allogeneic platform and that, that's obviously quite a deliberate strategy on our part because what you have in an, a manufacturing process based on generating an allogeneic product is, is essentially a model where you, you create you know, a homogeneous product which is reproducible, there are stringent release criteria, um, you know, large you know, batch sizes. So it's, it's kind of a model that's much more along the, the lines of, of, a, of a pharma type model, mm -hmm. a drug model. Um, with autologous on the converse side, you've got really a kind of host of variables that you need to deal with. I mean, the patient is the variable. So, you know, elderly, disease, each of those could impact the, the nature and quality of the stem cells you can harvest and manufacture, which could then impact on your yields. You've got the variability that comes with that. You will have inevitably, I think, a much higher cost of goods in that process. You will have issues like, you know, if you get contamination, the whole thing's scrubbed. You, you know, you really have to start from the beginning. So it's, it's a really difficult model, uh, I think, to sustain. So we, we much prefer you know, an off-the-shelf allogeneic model, which, for example, in the case of um, therapies that may require immediate you know, application of the cell, the allo model off the shelf is really the only one that's going to work. Mm -hmm. Autologous, if you're going to wait six weeks or more to generate your product, that's not going to be effective in patients which you know, have just, um, for example, had a stroke and where you know, maybe early intervention is going to be critical in, in, in uh, resulting in a meaningful impact on the, on the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. But Greg, I do think when, when you look at these, that's as I referenced about the business guys kind of getting pulled mm -hmm. in early in the process. It, uh, you know, our, our commercial product is allogeneic. Our first acquisition we did earlier this year was an allogeneic. Um, but we're not, you know, afraid of autologous. But I think it comes back to this idea of beginning with the end in mind and, and going out and looking at, as, as was kind of referenced by Paul, you know, there are certain conditions that an allogeneic would be great. Um, but there's also others that an autologous would be great. And, mm -hmm. it's, and it's kind of looking at what does that patient need, what's the logistics around that, what is the uh, you know, appetite for a price point, uh, you know, how much is that unmet need. And it's, so it's really taking that idea and fast forwarding it you know, eight or ten years out, as best as we can guess, of what environment you're going to launch that into and, and try to figure out you know, does it make sense from a business perspective. And so I've, I've actually become a pretty big fan of both. So you're not hindered by e either approaches? Mm -hmm. no. Jay, same way? Uh, yeah, well, we, we're, uh, we look at both, and we're, we're, we're engaged in both. I think, uh, obviously, uh, I would agree that uh, an off-the-shelf um, aloe approach, particularly if you're starting with a, a, a pharmaceutical industry structure, mm -hmm. you've already got the the supply chain, the, the marketing organization built around that approach, there's, there's a, lot to be, a lot to be said for that. Um, of course, you have issues of, of immunogenicity and mm -hmm. other issues that, and I think you have to look disease by disease and product by product is what's, what's the right uh, mm -hmm. or likely technology. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that that is where you're seeing this convergence. You know, we're, and again, why I think we were acquired is you have within Shire Division that small molecule and then human genetic therapies. And so there was an ability for Shire to look at both of these because HGT is, is very customized, you know, orphan, high price, than the small molecule business. And there were elements of both of those in Regen Med. And so it's that ability to work between those two concepts and say, yeah, it's probably a new model. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's when, uh, when we were acquired, that really was the mindset. We're gonna create a third division and it's going to be a different business than our small molecule or genetic therapies. And, it, and it's so far, you know, it's working. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think to that point, it's, you know, where is that model? And, and what companies are going to be able to adjust to this new way of doing business mm -hmm. that some of these technologies are yeah. going to bring? You know, in that, in that regard, I, I, I'd comment that, you know, Johnson & Johnson's largest product, selling product, is, is Remicade. Um, Remicade was developed by Centacor, which was purchased by Johnson Johnson, I don't know, about 12 or 13 years ago, but it was developed by Centacor prior to Johnson & Johnson. And um, it required, you know, maybe not as radical a difference uh, as you might need for autologous therapy, but it required 
a very different um, business model because it was an infusional therapy mm -hmm. uh, for patients with, uh, initially it was actually first in bowel disease, arthritic disease, skin disease, a variety of diseases now. And um, at the time there weren't infusion centers outside of oncology settings. That, that, and, and I think a lot of business people at the time felt that that was a, a pretty high risk and it's not clear to me whether there would have been, you know, other things being equal, a lot of interest in pharma in the early stages and in investing in something with that unproven business model. Right. But of course, uh, Centacor was, uh, was able to prove it effective and once they were, uh, and actually make it a reality and, um, and got acquired yeah. and, and obviously the product grew tremendously from, from that. Let's talk about that. Um, you know, like you said, Centacor had to prove it and then ultimately Johnson & Johnson acquired it. Now, you know, Roche is certainly in this space. Johnson Johnson is now in the regenerative space. But you, you all are the exception for the most part in terms of big pharma getting into this field. What does it take? What, what, what's your own kind of opinion of the industry? And why does pharma not get more bold and courageous and move here? Yeah. So, I mean, actually, it's, it's, we're not the exception anymore. I mean, okay. there, are, there are most big pharma company either have invested already or are on the verge of investing uh, in, into this space. But yeah, I mean, not every of these investments leads to a, a press release, you know? So I mean, that, that's a little bit of a difference, obviously. So you see a lot of activity going on. And you see, see it because you're competing for deals right now. Actually, no, because then why I do you say what you say? In my other role, I'm, I'm chairing the industry committee of ISSCR. Mm -hmm. So there, from there, you know, we, we, we know from each other. And I mean, it's not, it's not, there's no secret. So, I mean, there are many, uh, many companies are in the field. And, and it goes back to what I said before, you know. Um, the, now I can only speak for Roche, but I see also for the others, you know, is that our approach is really that um, we, we need to have a, a good, solid foundation in the science uh, before we believe in an opportunity in mm -hmm. order to move forward. And um, of course you can trust that whoever you acquire, if there is some things to acquire, <laughs> can bring this expertise, right? So that's one way to do it. Another way is, is that you actually in order to be able to, uh, to evaluate whether what you want to uh, bring in is of value, you need to have some expertise for yourselves. And that's what I see now, you know, many big pharma companies are building up their own expertise in order to basically be ready to make To be an investor. Deal. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So you, you see the same thing, Jay? Yeah, I think that, you know, there, there are a lot of voices in pharma that, you know, would you know, would prefer to focus on shorter term, lower risk um, opportunities. But I, I think there's an, a growing recognition that, um, as we were discussing before, that it's really important to be differentiated and address major unmet medical needs. So you can't, you can no longer go into marginal um, differentiation and expect to, to be profitable. As you look across the space of Boulder integration, there's a lot of different directions you can go, um, you know, other than specifically cell therapy or stem cell therapy. And um, so how companies make that decision, I think, will vary. I certainly think one of the factors is, um, for, those, for the most part, pharma companies are likely to want to invest a little bit later in the game, after there, maybe after there's proof of concept, they've moved along. Mm -hmm. But I do agree that there's certainly a recognition that in order to be able to do that, and to do that wisely, because there's so many opportunities, you really need to have your, your uh, expertise in-house of people who really understand the business and what works sure. and what doesn't. And then, what do you do in-house? Because you have to make choices in terms, mm -hmm. you know, there's only so much money that's going to go into long-term high-risk mm -hmm. uh, internal opportunities and, and there's a lot of potential directions and I think uh, the reason we do it is a combination of having um, some really bright innovative scientists who've been able to make substantial progress and 
every year when the skeptics come and say, well, show me the data, and by that I don't only mean the scientific mm -hmm. data, I also mean the market data, sure. they've got something good to show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have you know, a, a handful over the years of different uh, leaders and champions who have been supportive of that happening. And so uh, that's sort of a mix that I think, you know, for, for what happens internally in a company. Yep. But, yep. Uh, uh, but at some point, I think you sort of need some of that uh, to the point made to, in order to be able to really be out there and know where you want to make an investment as, as products are moving closer yeah. to success. So it's encouraging. Uh, the larger pharmaceutical companies, in your words, are building up their core expertise to be able to even evaluate opportunities in the space now. Yeah, I'm not going to speak to the other companies. Are they knocking yeah. on your door? But J&J &J, &J <laughs> does some of that. I could kill you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> no, but are you seeing the same thing, that the knowledge base is increasing and that there is more activity of, hey, Paul, let's go have lunch and people wanting to talk to you now? Yeah, I mean, to it's some changed. extent, it has. But I mean, I mean, to some extent, while I accept all of that, you know, the other way of looking at it is, is it's large pharma dipping its toe mm -hmm in the stem cell pool, as it were, just to see, you know, do I like the temperature? Is this something we can... And, and we just don't know how, how it's all going to pan out. Mm. I, I was going to, in, th in hearing the responses here, I mean, I'll, I'll give a different sort of view to, to the question that it, it surprises me that pharma doesn't get more engaged in this. If, if you think about the causality of disease, it's generally not a single pathway. Mm. And yet the pharma industry is, is largely based on targeting individual pathways. So to me, you know, there's going to be some level of efficacy you demonstrate with a drug, small molecule, whatever, in targeting that particular pathway. But for, for a stem cell based therapy, you've got essentially a, a sort of living pharmacopoeia of drugs, but potentially that, that can be mm -hmm. generated on, on demand in a, in a sort of context, disease specific manner. It, it, it seems strange to me, I think, you know, uh, that, that that wouldn't be seen as a major bonus because. You think about what, or in our cells, in our cells make a whole bunch of immunoregulatory molecules, they make growth factors, chemokines, and we don't know all that they mm -hmm. make by far. Now, there's no way, if you could make those all in recombinant form, there's no way you could develop a therapy around that. Yeah. I just couldn't conceive of how you do that. Yeah. And yet we're sort of seeing evidence in our, in our studies of, of responses that, that are, you know, I think really quite remarkable in many cases. I, I just can't see that the pharmaceutical industry could could continue along the traditional line and not sort of take note of, of, of mm -hmm. what these cells would do. So. We're going to open up the questions here in a, in a minute or two. Um, Greg, I, I, yeah, please. I was just going to I, I think part I mean, of Shire made a very bold move acquiring you. <laughs> yeah. and, well, no, I was, I was going to say. And were there others knocking on your door? Or were they, um, I mean, you don't have to say, but do you agree with the comments we, we here? We had others knock on the door. And, I, and what I was going to say was I think what I see is this, um, you know, big pharma and venture back kind of doing this um, in that a lot of what I now find my job doing is uh, almost like a translator um, between, okay, here's what venture tries to, venture back can get to, um, and here's the standard that big pharma has when they look at a clinical program. And I spend most of my time trying to explain to the venture back guys what big pharma wants and to the, my team at Shire, yeah, but guys, they only had 30 million. I mean, this is the best they could do. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a lot of what I see. And, and our acquisition that we did earlier this year, it was all premised on redoing the phase two program. Hmm. So, I mean, we, we looked at the phase two that was done by Pervasis and we knew it was venture backed. They just did not have the capital to do a phase two program to the level that a global pharmaceutical company would do. So we structured the deal in such a way that had us redo the phase two. Mm -hmm. But that was not easy yeah. um, to, to put that model together and to get the venture backers to agree to the deal structure to allow us to do that. Um, and so that's what I, I think I'm seeing is, yeah, they're coming to the table at times, but there's just this difficulty with, well, why did you do that? You know, and, mm -hmm. and, and you see, I see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, because venture just doesn't do it to the same level. Mm -hmm. yeah, so interestingly, to, so yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, to uh, very quick comment to that. That's that's very good that you described this situation because I mean that has nothing to do with cell therapy. Mm -hmm. That is nothing. Uh, this is this is a yeah. very general approach. That mm -hmm. that is yeah. just the situation it is. You know, mm -hmm. between these two worlds, 
we have to deal with all the time. And, and I mean, but that's, that's good. I mean, that, yeah. that's good. A, a comment to you, Paul, maybe. You, uh, you described all these uh, potential um, effects that um, the cells may have, and you described it in a very positive way, and you picked out the positive uh, examples. But of course, that's also, and, and just to, um, I don't want to be the, to sound uh, negative, but I want to give the perspective like the that advocate, obviously yeah. that is exactly what Big Pharma <laughs> um, uh, chases away from that, you know. Right. Oh, it does all these kind of things, you know. <laughs> what, what are mm, we getting mm. into here, you know. And, uh, and as long as, and, and you're right, it, it's obviously a, a potential that can be harvested. And as I said before, I mean, many if not all of the Big Pharma players are now tipping their toes, as you says. As you said, and uh, and some of us uh, a bit longer, and, and have built our expertise and getting to know what these cells exactly exactly do and see the potential. But on the other hand, it's not it's not the only way forward. You know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's as you said that there are portfolio decisions to be taken, and uh, as long as um, I mean, at Roche, honestly, we we had we had such a big portfolio that we. Had Hard things, you know. Mm -hmm. So as right. long as you have other opportunities that sure. can go the established way, yeah, of course yeah. you 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 think twice um, whether you want to go the established way or the new way or yeah. both. Let, right. let, but I, I would I would want yeah. to just also not not leave the audience with the impression that you know we're absolutely against the, the pharmaceutical industry and drug targeting. You know, I, I've long believed that at the end of the day, I, that probably the most meaningful impact will be from a combination of cells and drugs. I mean, well, interestingly, <laughs> drug targeting has moved in a bit in the direction you're, you're speaking of in that uh, I, at this point, I think the latest statistics are over half of discovery efforts in industry are in, are, are in what's called phenotypic screening instead of specific targeting, you know, looking at the broad array of activities right. that each molecule has and fitting that array to the, to the desired array. Although, obviously, there's issues around the, the, the spectrum and the ability to get, get the, uh, the activities you want. I think, though I do think uh, your point is valid, and I think, frankly, you would want um, to go into areas where you think there is a substantial advantage to cell therapy over non-cell therapies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many people predicted in the case of uh, the early um, antibodies and cytokines that they would soon get replaced by small molecules. But uh, because of a variety of issues, the types of targets, the shapes of proteins they could bind with, the, the high degrees of specificity and, and affinity, um, the, the competition has been less in many fields than, than many predicted. And mm -hmm. I think as you think about, you know, moving with cell therapies, you'd want to exploit some of those right. sorts of traits and go into areas where the multifunctionality or, or whatever else give you, a, or the uh, locality or whatever give you an, a, 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 a significant advantage over uh, alternative modalities that especially ingested uh, drugs. Uh, maybe just a, one last question, then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, when you look over the next five, ten years in the United States, there is going to be severe cost controls implemented into the healthcare system, one way or the other. Does regenerative medicine stand up against those future economics uh, well, or is it too high cost of a solution potentially in this new cost-contained environment we're heading into? I, I think it does. Um, it holds up well. I, I, you know, I wouldn't be still doing this if I didn't think it did. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think it does. I, but I, again, I think it comes back to an educated approach to the opportunities where you choose to go, that you choose to go after the, the uh, whether autologous, algenic. You know, I don't think it's going to be a, uh, a simplistic, you know, one, one thing is going to fix everything. It, it's really going to require a much more intelligent approach to which technology should advance in which diseases and where they're going to provide the payback. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it's um, not always the tasteful discussion, but it really is going to come down to a lot of this ROI, the payback, not just for the uh, manufacturer, but also for the providers for the healthcare system. And, mm -hmm. and how are you going to do that? And, um, and I'm very optimistic, but I don't think every technology that's in development right now is going to cut it. Yep. Um, it's it, uh, you know, I'm just based on all the things I look at. 
if 10% fit that criteria, I'd be surprised. Okay. Just with what I see being developed right yeah. now. Any other thoughts? And yes, ab absolutely. I mean, that's that's why we are we are in the game here. Because if you think about the the potential that these um, these novel treatments, novel um, modularities can bring to the patients, then to treat unmet medical needs, then I mean that these solutions will reduce healthcare spending dramatically. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Even though the, the initial investment may be higher, but the outcome is certainly beneficial. I mean, that's why we're doing this. Otherwise, for incremental benefit, we are not doing this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and the, certainly the potential is there. And, and I, but I think that not only do you have to choose your areas well in terms of differentiation, you have to plan your development well. Because in order to, 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 to have appropriate market access, you're going to have to address a lot of the needs of payers you have, that means um, the right indications, the right ability to target so that, you're, 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 that the, the money that's being spent is truly uh, yielding um, value, um, the right um, uh, uh, costing, uh, uh, you're going to have to bring your cost down so you can hit uh, in production so you can um, bring a, 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 a an appropriate uh, value to the table, mm -hmm. and the right endpoints that okay. to 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 demonstrate the the full. Spe it's one thing to go out there and say, "Look at all the costs this is going to save." I think we're entering an environment where, if you say it, even if people believe it, they're going to be under a lot of pressure to say, "Go out and prove it," and then come back with with mm -hmm. data, and that means planning up front, how am I going to show that there's fewer hospitalizations, fewer emergency room visits, fewer, you know, real, really unload burden on the system. But I think if people, the, the potential is there with the, with the I mean, this is a, is a revolutionary methodology. Yep. It's, it's figuring out the right business model, the right indications, and then, the, and then getting the right data to, right. to sell the product. That's right. I think we have time for a couple of questions. I don't know if we have a... Uh, microphone out there, but uh, it's a small, audi uh, small audience here that we can probably do without it. Right here, please. Yeah, my question is, is, I mean, I tend to think of like approvals and regulatory as basically being the entire universe of development <laughs> of any kind of, of, of therapy. Uh, and, and how would you say that the cell-based therapies are going to compare you know, to biologics and then going back and comparing to, to small molecules? You know, it's, like, it's not like you can really sterilize a, a biologic or a, or a cell. And is, is this going to be sort of ending up being kind of at the very beginning, at the very beginning of research stages of thinking in terms of compliance, especially in terms of derivations and, and, and what kind of markers you have to look at for whether it's it, just to verify that the cell you have is what you think you have, right? Because we're dealing with really a black box here. You know, it's development, it's differentiation, it's, 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 it's really not any single target. But I was just curious as to like what the orders of magnitude of those costs are, because to me it just seems that everything is regulatory compliance. Of, of the costs? Yeah, well, yeah, ultimately of your expenses, yeah. Uh, yeah. First, let me just say, it, it is, I think, one of, the, one of the problems that some biotech companies get into is thinking everything is regulatory compliance, and that once you have approval, uh, that, that, that's, <laughs> then everything is sold in. Happened. And I, I think that the increasing of the reality is that market access is driven as much by payers as it is by regulators. And it, certainly that's the case in Europe already. And increasingly, although the U.S. has a political aversion to any suggestion of cost effectiveness, the, the um, insurance industry is stepping into the gap, recognizing that there's only so many dollars to go around, and uh, healthcare costs keep going up, and those dollars aren't going to be going up, at least not the public dollars over the next several years. So um, they're, they're looking for, for what they're not going to pay for, and they're going to be looking. As, as to the issue of, uh, of regulatory uh, compliance, though, I'd say, again, I, I can't speak the cost of doing that in, in, in any, with, with great expertise. I can say it is one of the most critical um, issues how to make these products in a matter that, that, is, um, that is, is, is suitable for regulatory approval. But I don't think it's that intractable an issue. You know, the, the history of the regulation of biologics, first of all, you know, every, every unit of red cells and platelets that are transfused in this country are, are, under, uh, are approved under, under BLA. Not, well, not every, but many of them are approved under BLA. 
Um, there have been a number over the years of, uh, of uh, cell therapy products approved. There's been a time in, for biological proteins where the issues around getting a sterile and consistent pro uh, product were every bit as intractable as the issues can be now for cell therapies, and yet products got approved, and I think they will continue to get approved if, 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 the, if, if companies are, if, if the manufacturers are diligent enough to address those issues to the, to the state of the, of the technological art, I, I believe that regulators will be, uh, as long as the efficacy is there, will be enthused about it. But I don't know if that addresses your question, but certainly that's my perspective. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I can't put a price tag on that. <laughs> Let's take uh, one or two more questions. Great. So uh, you spoke earlier about uh, you know setting up even manufacturing facilities globally. I was wondering, both on the market side and on the development manufacturing side, how having a global perspective has been an advantage to your organizations. Is that correct? Uh, to me? Oh, open-ended. Um, well, we, you know, we're about fifty percent of our business is overseas, um, and uh, we have R and D very decentralized uh, around the world, and we do that uh, for uh, a couple reasons. One is is that we don't believe in R and D that there's real scale uh, in terms of this biological space, and so smaller teams, more focused in their efforts, uh, seem to win and seem to do better. So that's why we really decentralize our R and D efforts. And then we, uh, so last year we had one microphone in this audience, <laughs> and we had to pass it around. This year we're hearing conversations in the back, so next year it's going to be perfect. But anyway, so that's why we do R&D in a very decentralized way. And then in terms of manufacturing, really in this space it's about risk mitigation. So uh, we're one of the largest providers of, for example, cell culture media to the biological space. And all of our big clients want to have redundancy. So we've got a very large facility here in the United States. We've got a second very large facility in, the, in Europe, uh, in Scotland. And probably in about three to four years, we'll be building a very large facility in Asia. Um, and so redundancy, um, consistency of supply, I think that's some of the things you're going to need to be very, really successful in this regenerative medicine space. So let's take one more question, then we'll wrap it up. This is to the, anybody who wants to tackle it, but w w I'm, I'm concerned from time to time that we um, are so busy attempting to r r repeat how therapeutics were developed by past modalities that we're not taking advantage of the new environment that we live in and the new tools that we have at our, at our access. Um, and I'm wondering whether we're missing the opportunity. There's very few personalized cell therapy approaches being pursued at the moment, as best I can tell. And I'm wondering whether we're missing the opportunity to pursue more personalized approaches to cell therapy as a way of, a, of, of minimizing the complexity of this therapeutic as opposed to adding to the complexity of it, further to Paul's point. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, you saw that tension here of this seems to make a lot of sense, and then rightfully so, Matthias said, yeah, but there's more degrees of variation possible. And so how would you ad address this question of maybe it requires a, an entirely new mindset to be fast and to win and get the market in this space? Well, one remark of caution here. I mean, first of all, yes, I appreciate that thought, you know, and, and also there is a rationale in order to, to approach it differently because we have a different modality. But at the end of the day, what we want to do is, is the, 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 the target, if you like, without this respect, is to say it's the patient. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, you cannot uh, expose the, the patient. That there is a reason why, why these regulatory pathways are set in, in place, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not based on a modality. It's based on, on that we are the dealing outcome. with a human mm -hmm. being. Yeah. yeah. A any other thoughts to this question? I, I guess my perspective is that the, and I'm not exactly sure what, what the questioner had in mind in, in, in suggesting that individualized therapies may, may be less expensive. But, but my, I would suggest that what's probably the most fixed in the development pro process is the phase three clinical trial. I think regardless of what you may believe the science tells you, that a regulator and a payer is going to want to see 
control data that allow them to draw firm conclusions about efficacy. I think short of that, however, how you get there, there's a lot of room for using new science and new direction to, to um, generate um, product-specific development pathways. And I think that um, th at the FDA has a lot of in individuals who are interested in that sort of innovation. They have some who are not, but there's a lot, especially at the leadership levels. And even in legislation recent, the FDASIA, um, um, talks about breakthrough products and, and, and wanting to um, work with companies and help innovate in how they can be developed. So I do think there, there is a lot of room for thought about how a novel modality might travel down a different pathway. But ultimately, showing efficacy in a controlled trial, even if, you, even if we, we had um, you know, expansions of, of progressive or accelerated approval that allowed people to get regulatory approval without really firm demonstration of efficacy, I, I don't think that's a, that's a ticket to market success. Because mm -hmm. you, you get to the market, you're now unable to do a controlled trial, and you're unable to convince anybody that you've actually provided right. enough value, because you can't quantitate the value, right. to, to, to make the therapy affordable. Great. Well, we've run out of time. Um, panelists, thank you very much for joining us uh, here today. If you could give them a warm round of applause for their contribution. Thank you very much. Okay. Greg, and just to add, we're going to have a, a brief 10-minute break, and we'd like everybody to be back here at 10 after 9, and then we'll begin our company presentations. We'll see you then.